we want to hear the stories from the courses that you've taught. Whether in a lab, a classroom, kitchen, on Zoom, or in a shop. Drawing on your expertise, we'll ask the probing questions. What goes right and what goes wrong when teaching your favorite lesson? Welcome back, everybody, to My Favorite Lesson, a podcast hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College. I'm Dr. Lauren Spring, and I am lucky enough to be here today with Karen Kokalink who is a professor of electrical and energy systems and engineering technology with Conestoga. Hi, Karen. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for being here. So typically I like to start off these discussions by just learning a little bit more about you, kind of your, you know, maybe professional background, how you ended up at Conestoga, anything that you'd like to share. All right, so my background, I, I took mechanical engineering at okay. University of Waterloo, and then I started working at uh, pretty much a, a dream job, which I, I know a lot of students would love to have, and that's designing cars. Oh. Uh, and, and that was really fun. Uh, while I was designing cars, I worked. I was a volunteer for some robotics clubs in high school high school robotics clubs called First Robotics for inspiration and recognition of science and technology. And I found that very gratifying, the process that the students would go through and these youth uh, developing themselves and and, uh, reaching goals uh, through through technology. Um, And uh, I I found that very inspiring. At the same time, I, I did my master's degree while I was working at General Motors. And I got to a point in life where I I uh, wasn't volunteering for robotics anymore, and I missed that that connection and that um, mm-hmm. that that gratifying feeling of of um, developing somebody. Uh, mm-hmm. in, and I didn't have that quite in my day job, so that's when I I wanted to pursue finding that again, and and I really wanted to teach and teach that same age group uh, where mm-hmm. they're at a point in their life where you can really make a difference, mm-hmm. and um, and help them with, you know, growth in a positive way. So that's why I wanted to pursue uh, teaching. And, and I reached out to Conestoga and said, this is, uh, this is a reason why I want to be here. And mm. here are my technical expertise. Uh, but I think what really what I have is, is an expertise to reach this, this age group. I want to be with young people. I want to be with, yeah. y- with youth as, as they're going through the formative time in their life. Wow. And so you mentioned first robotics. I'm not, I don't have a very technical background, but um, my understanding is it's a high school robotics competition, essentially, where different schools create their own robots and come together on these big sort of event days. And, and you were a judge with them. Is that what it is? Yeah, I've, okay. I founded some teams and I mentored some teams and uh, founded some junior uh, teams as well. Uh, and uh, for the for the past decade, I've been judging the regional here in Waterloo. Oh, cool. Absolutely. But it, it's a um, it's to promote science and technology to young people through a global competition where uh, gracious professionalism is encouraged. So uh, it's mm. really the integrity uh, and the experience of the youth that uh, the robots are, are developing. So the process develops the youth. It's really not so much about youth building robots. Interesting. So yeah, much bigger picture. It's kind of some pedagogy like underlining the entire event, I suppose. Absolutely. I like that you said gracious professionalism. What do you think that means to to you, to them? Yeah, I mean, that, that's important. It means, it means teamwork. It means integrity. It, it means going out of their way to, to help others. It means sharing mm-hmm. tools, uh, sharing ideas. It, it means what I, I tell my students is, is that to bring somebody up doesn't bring you down. Mm. I love that. Well, and it's interesting. I mean, <clears throat> it's probably a stereotype, but I, <laughs> I know that there is a stereotype out there of a lot of folks who go into more technical fields, um, you know, are, are maybe less social or they're kind of they maybe thrive in environments where you know it's them in an equation or, or some sort of technical problem um 
but that reminder i mean taking part in these competitions that reminder that that the kind of the group and and this sort of peer support is, is vital to success is interesting to me yeah and and these youth maybe have felt different the rest of you know their life up until they have found first robotics and mm-hmm. and in that process have realized that there are many other people who are like them. Mm. So they are also meeting like-minded people from around the world, which is very special. That's really And they can embrace who they are. Right. Yeah, and celebrate it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, I've heard such wonderful things about it. Um, And you mentioned, so you're working for General Motors designing cars. What what did you like about that? Uh, It's a really great company, very nice place to work. Uh, they treated me very well. Mm. Uh, what I really liked about General Motors is that they would hire youth right out of school and then put them on a rotation and get, give them a lot of experience, experience, you know, in the manufacturing environment and the design environment, uh, traveling to United States, Mexico, all the different design centers. Mm. I really enjoyed that. I, I was I was younger. I had less less commitments at home. I did a lot of travel. Mm. Uh, so I quite enjoyed, you know, taking the company cars down to the States. Uh, my job was designing suspensions. So when I made a technical change on the suspension, no matter how much software you have that will analyze that change, you still need to put it in a vehicle and, and ride it on a track. Mm. So I would say my favorite time uh, at General Motors was that I had my own tools uh, I had my own hoist. I I changed my own parts on the cars, and then I had driver training uh, to get the the cars out on a track. And so you would be the one actually taking them around the track. Absolutely, wow. I, I got to do that as a designing engineer. I wasn't the one who um, was sort of a calibrated expert at that, though. <laughs> so uh, I I wasn't an expert. I had other people who could really judge the tiny differences in in a material change that you put on a suspension and and they would they they would uh approve or or suggest some changes yeah but I certainly always literally was able to go along for the ride (laughs) that's so neat yeah and what a diverse kind of skill set and in one kind of job title to be able to do all of those things is really neat it's really great so uh, I, what I was looking for at the time was something that I wouldn't get bored with. I wanted a job where I could go to multiple locations and have, you know, a, a, a desk in different places and, and be away from that desk often, um, be outside, even when you work in manufacturing and in automotive, you have out, some of the vehicles are outside as well. So your plant extends and it's, it's nice to, uh, to have a lot of different places to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, manufacturing was really great as well because you do have your office, but you're you're usually on the plant floor. Okay. So the plant floor is a big place, and it's it's sort of a community unto itself. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed that and all the different people that I met. Really neat. And that's, I mean, I would say to their credit, too, that, that what you're describing, how they really like to hire young people sort of right out of school and... Um, where do you think that comes from? Is it a fresh ideas kind of thing or sort of mentorship is built into the company objectives or, or mission? Yeah, I, I think it's a smart idea. And I do know some companies who, who do that. And I, I often encourage my uh, the students who are graduating out of my program to look for a company who would do this. Mm-hmm. I think it's in the company's best interest because if you're developing an engineer, that engineer, uh, if, it, if that engineer could have knowledge of all, all of the different systems and processes and software that that makes the company run, then it would be it makes them better at their job. Yeah, yeah, and I guess for for people new to the profession too, they can see where their passion really lies, right? Being able to try on all those different things and think, oh, maybe this part is the best fit for me. Or absolutely, it's sort of a win win. Mm. And so then you found, yeah, you you had missed what your work with First Robotics and thought there was something in, about teaching and and um, working with students that you you wanted to find again. I imagine Conestoga was happy to <laughs> happy to have you. And how long have you been with the college now? I've been with the college for fourteen years. Wow. Yeah. And so, what have you seen? If you think all the way back to fourteen years ago when you were sort of a fresh new teacher here at the college. What do you think are some of the major changes you've seen, either within your program or maybe within pedagogy itself? 
Oh, so much. It's it's mm-hmm. been a really interesting time. And I I, I think, well, Conestoga has a lot of opportunities, research, et, et cetera, uh, to do if I, uh, I, I used to say when I get bored, but I haven't got bored. <laughs> <laughs> it's really been mm-hmm. interesting. When I first started, one of the things I would say to my class when we had an exam, I would say, uh, please put phones and smartphones at the front of the room so and they were different things back then oh yeah and I I can't believe I've been here for so long that 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 actually sounds old-fashioned right Mm, that's right and and I don't think I even had a a, a what we what we called smartphone (laughs) at the time so now if I said that terminology they'd say what what do you mean my my phone then (laughs) right (laughs) Um, I find uh, the the student body even uh, the similar in in a lot of ways, of course, but um, vocabulary of the mm. student body has sort of changed over the years as well. I learned many new words. Okay, now uh, when and I like started, kind of colloquial ones or like or like technical new new technical terms. No, from them. sort of. Um, uh, like uh, slang, like or mm, urban dictionaries, okay. slang right. kinds of things, or, or little, you know, short forms in the chat. And, gotcha. you know, W, for example, uh, I would oh, say I something and the, and the whole chat lights up with W and, and I have to ask them, OK, help me out. What does W mean? <laughs> it means win. Win. Yes. So I, I ah. learn I learn these new words. I, I think, didn't know that. I one. think that's pretty exciting. Um, and I guess that's because of, you know, social media and everything now. Yeah. Huh. And so that's if uh, you were so to say something that they really agreed with or thought was a great idea, then it would be W. Absolutely. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, so I know that now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting how, how times have changed. And when I first started, I was 29. Uh-huh. Uh, so I actually didn't, didn't really look uh, too different from the student body. Mm-hmm. So uh, I was handed orientation packages and welcomed to to the school. Oh, wow. And would you like a map? <laughs> Things like that. <laughs> Walking down the hall to teach. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, did so. you find that, did that um, make for a challenging dynamic with students when you were sort of up at the front of the room and they thought you were one of their peers? And did that? I, I didn't find that. Um, I really like teaching large class. Hmm. large classes so I always ask for the largest classes possible oh, really? so I'm often in a large lecture hall and that's where I feel most comfortable okay. is a large lecture hall and when you're in the large lecture hall and your voice is projected um, and you sort of have a presence at the front of the room hmm. I quite enjoy it hmm. and 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 I walk back and forth and, and everything. And I, I feel I've always felt respected by the by the students. Yeah. So even though our, our age was was closer and, you know, back then I didn't I didn't feel like our age was 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 as close. <laughs> now that I'm 14 years older, I realized I was pretty close in age to them. Wow. But but I, I've always felt very respected by my students. And so you, it's fascinating to me that you say you like the large lecture hall. I mean, a lot of faculty find that intimidating, but you're, that's your comfort zone. Is that um, what do you think it is about it? That feel you're describing, kind of the walking back and forth, and um, are there other things you like about teaching many students at the same time? Yeah, it, it's it's an it's an interesting challenge to teach many students. It's interesting to to try to engage with with a lot of students. Um, I also. Uh, really like teaching because of the personal relationships with students. So there, there are more of them. But I, <laughs> I think, uh, and I'm, I'm not really a, a very outgoing person at all. I, I am sort of the stereotypical shy engineer. I, I think uh, some of it is actually that um, that in in a setting like that, it's like being in a big city, mm-hmm. and it's a, it's a little bit is a little bit more disconnected, actually, right. than if I were sitting in front of 10 people, mm. right? So I think that might be actually why why that's comfortable for me. That's really interesting. Yeah, because mm. there is a custom, right? Like if you're in a, yeah, if you're in the front of a classroom with just 10 or 15 students here, there's probably a lot of side conversation with students as, as they're coming in and some of those barriers yeah. are, are less clear, maybe. Right. And I really enjoy that as well. And by the time they're in third year, I have some small classes that are specialized classes. But by then, I know those students mm-hmm. very well. Um, I like having the large class when they first come to college because they they need somebody. 
they're a very interesting age group when they first come to the college because uh, we have students of all ages, of course. We mm-hmm. have a lot of students uh, from all, all uh, different ages and, and demographics. But a lot of our students who come in are, you know, uh, young and really literally yesterday we're sitting at their at their home <laughs> where, where they grew up in a lot of cases and and are um you know uh, in their childhood setting mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden they have they have a new place to go they don't know anybody they have the school work the actual work that they have to do they have to work for money some of them are moving moving out into their new place. They have commitments with relationships, right. friends, old friends, meeting new friends, par- uh, parents or guardians, mm-hmm. um, still, you know, asking questions and, and breathing down their necks. Yeah. So uh, in, in some cases. Um, so that is so much to balance. And it happens literally in a day. Right. So the first day of <laughs> class is is very interesting uh, because everybody is uh, is very nervous and Mm -hmm. and that's just human nature right is in there sort of in that fight or flight mode and and so I like to talk to them about how nobody knows each other right now and and you should be nervous I I bet you're nervous and (laughs) and and everybody beside you is nervous and and we all should be nervous in this situation Mm -hmm. Um, and then trying to get them to connect to each other is is really fun that's a beautiful thing, too, to say that out loud, right, and acknowledge that feeling. And obviously, it sounds to me like you have a good sense of who they are as full people, right? Not just students learning particular skills and achieving certain program outcomes, but yeah, the, all, everything that they're they're dealing with. It's a very complicated time in their life. It's it's uh, with, with <clears throat> lots of priorities, and, um, and, and we need to respect that. Yeah. Yeah, respect it and... and you know, it, it sounds beautiful to me that you take that into account. And yeah, and being, it's a privilege in many ways to sort of be one of their first professors in, in this important time in their life, right? And Absolutely, it is a privilege. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And it is when they're graduating as well. Because yeah. it's a privilege to see who they get connected with as employers and what kind of job offers they have, where they're going to be moving. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's yeah, absolutely. You've you've got it right. It is a privilege. And do you find many graduates of this program do most stay local, or are some of them, you know, or is it an even split kind of staying local, moving globally? Most of them want to stay local. I I think that's that's pretty fundamental with with what we're you know what we're educating for. It's mm-hmm. it's for our community. Um, for myself, when I when I am uh, when I have the privilege to develop course content, I always think about uh, provincially. Mm-hmm. So um, I I'm lucky enough to work in in energy, uh, teaching in energy systems, which is very interesting because there are a lot of changes in energy, yeah. and different things happen in in different provinces, which we will we will touch on, and, and different countries will will touch on. But what we're actually uh, educating them for and trying to prepare them for is is really this um, provincial uh, mm. en- energy market. So we'll follow the the province's uh, long term energy plan, for example. And it is fascinating because I mean I know even statistically graduates from Conestoga tend to want to stay <laughs> here, right? Whereas it's not always the same case for for folks coming from abroad um, and then you know going to different universities or different programs and then wanting to return. Abroad, there's. Uh, I think it's a really neat position to be in. Yeah, to be mentoring, teaching students uh, who are not only learning these skills, but really, yeah, setting up their lives in this particular region if they're not from here initially. That's right. This region has so much for them, and the jobs that uh, they are being educated for in the two programs I teach in, there's there's definitely a lot of opportunities in this region so they they really don't don't have to go anywhere else and yeah. so they can make make a life for themselves here and then really cool that you can align the curriculum accordingly right here the the abundance of options already in Ontario and <laughs> see what what fits for you absolutely and so Karen which courses you mentioned you teach in energy what what courses do you tend to teach now these days 
Well, it's it's those really big first year courses that that I love. Uh, there are some some topics which um, you know could could have have difficult content in it. For example, um, magnetism, uh, mag- okay. magnetic circuits. Right, mm-hmm. is a so it's a first year fundamental uh, physics topic that mm-hmm. they'll need to apply to uh, to the electrical systems going forward. Uh, and I teach digital systems, again, very fundamental mm. uh, first year material that they need to build on in second year and third year. Uh, programming, again, a fundamental first year. And then when I specialize into ener- energy, um, because myself, I'm a certified energy manager. So okay. I take a lot of that very interesting material in conservation and mm. energy management yeah. uh, and and, and I'm able to share uh, share some some uh, some pretty relevant um, material that is is about uh, you know lo- uh, Ontario's low carbon future, right? Okay. Canada's low carbon future. Uh, material that changes quite often, and, <laughs> and sort of uh, how to relate that to the technical field. Well, what kind of systems can we um, can we, can we uh, bring some efficiency changes and, and carbon capture and things like that too? Great. And you've brought with us today one of your favorite lessons. You brought to us today um, one of your favorite lessons. Can you explain what it is that you you look forward to teaching every semester and which course it fits into? Yeah, sure. So. I I love that question, a favorite lesson. I have a lot of favorite lessons Mm -hmm. because teaching in energy, there are a lot of very interesting uh, uh, lectures. So um, there's because the topic is interesting. So instead of bringing an interesting one, you know, for example, students love the lecture where uh, they learn what makes what makes you comfortable and what doesn't in a room. Oh, um, so you know the the um, ASHRAE standards of comfort conditions. They love that lighting, things like that. But oh. but that's that's easy. I I, I chose uh, sort of a hard technical concept where students aren't sitting at home and thinking, "Oh wow, I wish I knew." How pointers worked in the C programming language. So <laughs> they haven't been anticipating that class no. all semester. No, <laughs> no. So it's harder to to you know mm. get to keep everyone's focus. So what I'd like to talk to to you about is is a technical lesson about a very specific part of C programming language in first year, large class size, online. Oh wow! Taught over dinner time. Look at that. Look at <laughs> this is a great this is so, a great idea. Lots of barriers here. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of barriers to to getting that information uh, in 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 a deep learning uh, spot in their brains, right? Yeah. Uh, so that particular uh, lecture or a lecture like that, and I do have a lot of uh, a lot of content like that. Um, I, I'd sort of pull out all the stops in terms of active learning. Mm. Uh, and I do these technical lectures. I choose to do them actually remotely. Okay. Um, because during COVID, we really benefited from a lot of teaching and learning, actually uh, teaching us how to make interactive uh, uh, lessons, um, which which really works. And and I've I've been mm-hmm. you know uh, m- trying to make make them better and better since uh, since learning these these great techniques. Mm. So in a lecture like that, what I would do is on a Monday at eight a.m. No matter when my class is on a Monday at eight a.m., I, I post material for them to learn. Okay. Uh, some will access the material, some will not, and and that's okay, and that that is normal. Um, so the opportunity is out there. Um, you know, textbook reading is out there. So by the time I, by the time they walk into my class on you know pointers in C programming, <laughs> they're already I, riveted. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> textbook some diagrams. Of, some of them could know something, mm, right? right? And some of them could know something. So mm. the first thing I do then is is very important to start start class on time because mm. that respects the content, it respects the students, yeah. right? It respects the process and. Um, and and uh, and acts you know like a role model for them. Mm-hmm. So, but what I would do first is uh, in, in 
engage them with an interactive document. So I'll send them a link and they can all access this link. Okay. If they don't want to access the link that way or they cannot, then they can, you know, give feedback a different way. They can unmute their microphone. They can talk. They can type into the chat window or they can annotate on their screen, which means um, make a, a pen available just to write on top of the screen. Right. And and a lot of them go, so go straight into a document. So they all have a link to the same document. They can type in there and they can write in there. So lots of ways to express their uh, their their opinion and I would just ask a simple question at the beginning of class so tell me what you know about pointers <laughs> in C and and I wait I wait I wait, mm. I wait and then you get the odd uh a definition maybe they looked up a definition yeah quickly and pasted, googling it <laughs> right maybe yeah. and then I'll get you know a definition that came from someone's head and they knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So this is a class of, say, 50 people. Yeah. And that's just two. Right. So so then I pull it out of them. Okay, well, yeah. I need to hear from everybody, so put your name beside it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's where we start encouraging them that, you know, I give formative assessment grades every week. And formatively, if you have shown some growth in learning throughout the week or even throughout the lecture, then, you know, that grade will pop up for you. So they mm -hmm. know that. Oh, she's asking for asking for some some names. So then right. then they start putting their names on there. And uh, but then I have to um, then I give them the welcome to say, please tell me what you don't know about pointers hmm. and what you don't know about pointers is really important. So if you don't know about pointers, I want to see nothing <laughs> and I want your name beside the nothing. Huh. Right. So and then it just lights up. Oh, wow. just, and everybody's there. Everybody's in the chat window, everything. Absolutely nothing. What on <laughs> earth are you talking about? So I have this beautiful slide in a document that says that we know nothing. <laughs> and that's great because it's it's really no fun to teach to people who know what you're Totally. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Who, who know everything or <laughs> exactly. who pretend to know and aren't open to hearing. Yeah. For right. Sure. So then, then, okay, well, let's add a slide together and let's talk about what we need to know by the mm. end of today. Yeah. Because you're going in a lab with me tomorrow. And then <laughs> you you're going to have to answer this question as, you know, I, I call it an exit ticket, which mm -hmm. came from teaching and learning. Yeah. You're going to have to answer this exit ticket. And this is what you're going to have to do tomorrow. So let's just type together on this screen. Do you know, do you know what the question is you, you, you need to answer tomorrow? And then, um, you know, somebody might offer it up or even put it in there. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the whole class. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. We just established that we don't know that. Right. Mm -hmm. So then I'll start the lecture and uh, kind of like, fortunately, you folks came to the right place. <laughs> good thing you're here today, <laughs> yeah. then. Good thing you're here. I'm here. Right. We can figure so this tomorrow out. Tomorrow will be better. <laughs> and then and then there's not a lot of content in each lecture. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of content because when you have a really big class size, you have to get everybody. You don't want to lose people, right? Yeah. You want to get everybody to be understanding that. So there's not a lot of content. The actual content is a very, very small amount of what a two-hour lecture would be. Interesting. The actual content. So then I would teach what the actual content is in hoping that they're listening because, you know, they've just been encouraged to try to find these answers, yeah. you know, by by at least tomorrow. Mm. So, um so, so they're piecing all of that together. And some people might understand what I just said and listen. And some people, of course, didn't understand or weren't listening for whatever, whatever reasons that we all just don't listen to everything all the time. Right. right? Of course. So and then, you know, we'll take a break. Uh, we'll come back. And then we do, uh, again, from teaching and learning, the muddiest point. Mm. So uh, I'll ask the students, OK, well, um, some some people probably understood what we just did and some people probably didn't. So I'm going to throw you into some breakout rooms really quickly and you come up with the muddiest point. And the mm -hmm. students know what that means. It means uh, the the uh, part of the lecture that they did not understand or or um, uh, could use some further clarification on. Yeah. And then uh, I ask the students who did understand to please teach teach those students uh, about their muddiest point. Oh. And by the way, when you come back, I'm going to choose a random group to share one of their muddiest points, please. Um, okay. So make sure that you have a, a speaker. Mm. So then they go into their breakout rooms. They know that I can see their microphones going up and down and yep. you sharing <laughs> screens. Um, and I reward that effort by putting some formative assessment grades in. 
um, if I see a screen sharing and the microphone moving a lot and everything. So it sort of encourages you that sort of let work. them know in the moment that they're yeah. kind of <laughs> you, you give them a score in the moment or you're just keeping track of that in the background. No, it's it's in the moment. So okay. I'll have a second computer mm. and then I'll be popping I'll be popping up a formative assessment grade saying, don't worry about your exit ticket this week. I can see that you formatively have made progress already. Interesting. And I'll okay. put that in there. So now that person doesn't have uh, the admin of the exit ticket. Right. I know that they've learned. And okay. I, I know that they have met my criteria for the formative assessment. I have a rubric for it uh, where I can give them that score without that exit ticket. I see. Uh, so it, it just encourages them uh, to to participate in that in that breakout room mm. and and having a muddy point and still not knowing what what's going on is is still OK at this point. Right. Right. Because now you have your peers uh, helping you through that muddiest point. So then uh, they'll come back. I won't give them a lot of time on that. And that's just verbal and they don't have to write anything down. Come back. Uh, group four, who's your spokesperson? What mm -hmm. was the muddiest point in that group? And we don't have to say who had the muddiest point. Yeah. Um, what, what and, and, the group. and how was that clarified? And does anybody else have anything to, to add to that? Mm -hmm. And then we'll do an example problem as a class. Um, so I hope that at, at this point now I've explained the concept and their peers have explained their concept to us. Mm. Then we'll do an example problem, uh, which later on, let's say two weeks from now, we've forgotten all about pointers, right? Who doesn't? <laughs> yeah. So we need these example problems, right? We, we need, we need mm. full, full solutions to refer to. Uh, so we'll do an example together and then back into a breakout room for them to do examples on their own. But at this point, it's a shared document with, say, 20 different examples, right. groups 1 to 20. They each do the example. Uh, the reason why each example is different is because that gives them a study and document. Mm. Um, and and that's, that's really beneficial to them to download that and, and study for their final exam instead of just having one question that you would uh, go through as a class. Uh, if there's time. And so they basically, just so I understand correctly, so there's 20 groups. Each one kind of has their own question yes. that they're working on in their group. But then as a study document, they're going to have every other group's Absolutely. answers too. Right? Absolutely. So that's a really neat way of sharing, you know, and wanting to do well because, you know, if you're you're going to base your study <laughs> on what group number three did and that's incorrect, you know. You're, well, you're, and, and that's the thing. And sometimes it is incorrect. And, and mm -hmm. that's where it's gold mm -hmm. is when it's incorrect. So if... If there is time, what I try to do, of course, I have to go and mark it. And they know don't study off that document unless there's a check mark <laughs> beside it. <laughs> yeah. And then I download Quality it controlled this. Yeah. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but what's best to do if there is time is then I, I bring them back and I say, ooh, this is great. There are some errors. Mm. And then I'll, I'll either switch their groups around and I'll say, OK, if you were in group one, you're marking group 20. Mm. And then they have to go on to the other group's um, document and then mark it up mm. because you learn a lot marking up somebody else's document. Right. Right. Um, or uh, what another strategy that is nice to do is actually um, don't ask them to put any names on on their document. And then I will go through, hey, let's see how this one is. Mm. OK, we'll see this this uh, this particular line here. Uh, this is what it's doing, but I think maybe what did you mean it to do? And then mm -hmm. and then they get a bit interactive because now I'm I'm pointing out a document, you know, the slide they did. So they're eager to learn if they did it right. Right. And um, but then the rest of the other 19 groups are eager to see if they made the same mistake. Mm. And then what I have is every I see everybody going in, oh, I made that mistake too. And then they're <laughs> changing correcting. it all. Oh, wow. Right. So, But that means that 19 groups were listening to that error. Yeah. So it's when they're all correct, um, I, don't, I don't think I could capture the student's um, interest. Right. It's when there's errors. Mm. So when, when there's errors and they want to know if they did that error and then they're correcting their own and that's where the deep learning happens yeah. is, is when there's errors and how neat like shared documents are so lovely for that too because you can see the little initials like do do, do okay group four is <laughs> you know fixing yes. this in their table right now and um, that sort of busyness this kind of flutter of, of student activity is 
is a neat thing to see, but I think we've never actually been able to access in, in an in-person classroom, right? To, to the well, same extent. That's the thing. And that's why I'm a bit reluctant to take some of these large classes back. Mm. Uh, I teach a class that's digital and, you know, it, it's bouncing in and out uh, the same way. Uh, and it, it's called it's called digital electronics. Okay. And but that's a class size of 120. Mm. Uh, that, so that's first semester, 120. Yeah. And to be able to uh, make that many breakout rooms and, and get students engaged is is amazing. Yeah. Now, there are maximum number of uh, marks that can be made on a shared document, I have found. Oh, is that so? Uh, absolutely. Ah, and in the first few weeks of school, we actually <laughs> hit that. We surpassed that. Mm-hmm. Oh After midterms, then we don't, which is a, a mm. different problem. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but... Uh, it's really great. And if I were to take these very large courses back into the classroom, I know I would need to record them because we're just we're at a point where we realize that not everybody is OK to sit mm. in that particular lecture hall at that address at that particular time every single day. So yeah. we would have to record that that lecture, that material, and we would have to have them bring in their laptops to do these right. interactive yeah. um activities. There is no way I could go back to teaching sort of uh, chalk and talk in that large lecture hall, trying to in- engage everybody. Uh, I would I would engage a good 10 or 20 students, which is fantastic, but it's often the same ones. Right. Um, and I do feel like this, this method where I'm bouncing them in and out to learn, you know, a, a small idea like, like pointers yeah. um, is, is engaging it's, it's engaging all of them. And, and they want to come to that class because of that activity and mm-hmm. learning from their peers. Yeah. Um, now, not all of them can make it to that Zoom meeting either. It is recorded, but they try to because when it's recorded, they don't have that interactive time that working on the, the problems yeah. with their peers. Yeah. Right? Um, so they come back and the last thing we do then in the pointers lesson is we do one more slide to just to match the first slide. And I ask the same question. Um, All right, everybody, <laughs> what do you know about pointers? <laughs> and then and everybody needs their names somewhere in the chat window, whatever. Mm-hmm. And then it just it explodes with the right answer. Wow. And that's why it's my favorite mm-hmm. lesson. It's my favorite way of of teaching is because I can look at the slide that says nothing and then I can look at the slide that has genuine answers that are from, you know, their own words. They're not copied and pasted. Yeah. They're their own words. And they're then they're nicely describing describing what a pointer is. Yeah. And then I, I'll just remind them, this is the exit ticket. This is the question. Remember how scary it was. And they're like, yeah, it's no problem. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, so and that's that, great. And- and so neat. I mean, what you've really described is like a, a very eloquent bops lesson, right? Where you're they're, you're kind of hooking them in and then they're realizing what they don't know. And then you share the content. They're interacting with each other, learning from each other, correcting their own mistakes. And then they see in this kind of post-assessment, like, wait a second. Yeah, my knowledge has changed in the past hour, right. however long it, it may be. Yeah. And 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 then I, I tell them I'm proud of you and I genuinely mean yeah. I, I'm really proud of you. Yeah. Look at what you just learned in two hours. It's well, amazing. And to compare that to, I mean, you know, you could technically still be, quote unquote, doing your job if you showed up, you know, didn't really know, imagined most of them had done the readings or not or whatever your your assumption would be there, taught the content and then said, any questions? And maybe one or two would say yes or no and and call it a day, right? Like that that is also a, a different way of, of lecturing. And yet they wouldn't know that that they had all started off knowing almost nothing, right? And that sort of admission, okay, we're most of us are starting at at zero here. And then that ability to learn from one another, to to actually interact with with each other in a in a non-threatening way, right? That uh, yeah. And I mean, just hearing you describe it, I think, yeah, that's that's how learning happens. And that's right. True. And when I think back to you asked um, what it was like when I first learned what has changed. So a lot about how I teach has changed because mm-hmm. I would have been teaching that same lecture um, by putting it on the board right. and by saying, does everybody understand or what is the end now? What would my next line be? And it would be, you know, a couple of students who know what the next line would be. But the rest of them uh, would probably either be lost or that's when you get questions after class. 
Yeah. Because uh, they didn't have that opportunity to really learn it fully in class. Yeah. Questions after class and then probably a lot leaving feeling shame for, you know, assuming that other people know and they haven't understood and are maybe too embarrassed to to even ask those questions, right? Where right, or or even uh, academic integrity problems mm-hmm. uh, could could start surfacing, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. If they're feeling desperate, um, and I find it so interesting, you know, when you first came in when we were chatting off air, um, and you had said something like, "Yeah, no, I'm I'm teaching these these large classes." And doing active learning on Zoom, that's going really well. And I actually thought you were maybe being sarcastic <laughs> because that's typically when I'm consulting no. with folks, it's it's that. It's like, oh, I can't reach them on Zoom. And so I'm so happy that you brought in this example because it is, <laughs> I see it, it is actually going really well. And in fact, maybe arguably much better than than if it were in person. It it, it is. <laughs> and and I would absolutely need them to bring their laptops. And I, I've thought about this a lot. If I do have to bring these back into the classroom, I, I need them to bring their laptops and we need to make these interactive documents together we need to hop on them I I guess the difference would be is me walking in between aisles Um, but I don't know if they would feel as secure to be themselves and say I don't know Uh, I I think my students do feel more secure with with their cameras off and their microphones off and Mm -hmm. and working in those in those small groups and and even the large group setting I think that that does um uh, lend some security to to the students. So I really like the online learning uh, for big classrooms. Well, and uh, it's fascinating, right? Because I think a lot of the assumptions maybe faculty have is, okay, if their camera and their mic is off, they're not engaged. And yet what I'm hearing you say is, in fact, being in that kind of environment and that sort of those layers of protection can enhance their engagement. Absolutely. And I mean, you started saying, you know, one of the easier lessons to teach is what makes students comfortable in a space, for mm-hmm. example. And I think, you know, many of them are probably much more comfortable at home than if they trekked across <laughs> the province, in some cases across town, at least, or to a neighboring town. And a lecture hall is not, you know, that can feel kind of oppressive or, or challenging to some students, too. So... Being comfortable in a space. <laughs> well, even even getting getting ready uh, to go to class, even you know the social anxieties of uh, being with your peers in the classroom yeah. could be a barrier to to even getting in that building. So there are a, a lot of barriers that have been uh, taken down with uh, online learning. I believe. Well, I'm so thrilled you you shared this example today. I mean, there's I feel like I, I've jotted down countless questions I, I have for you here, but I I'm just conscious of our time here. Um, so rather than asking all of those, I'll, I'll have this conver- these conversations with you at another time. Um, but we do like to end our podcast interviews by asking if there's anything, you know, some kind of interesting fact about you or, or something that you've done that maybe your students or colleagues aren't aware of that, that you'd like to share while you're here. Um, you know, it, it might be that I, I, I am quite a, a nerdy engineer, <laughs> um, but when I when I see students roll up in their their souped up vehicles uh, in the parking lot, um, they probably don't know how I used to soup up my vehicles. Oh yeah, uh, myself <laughs> by hand and um, and and uh, I'm a trained uh, a driver and used to be on a racing circuit and um, I, I could I could probably beat them. Um, that would be hilarious. <laughs> it would be parking lot funny. parking lot race. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Well, thank you, Karen. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing all of these great ideas. Um, It's certainly something in teaching and learning. I mean, I think online synchronous Zoom classes are here to stay, (laughs) even post-pandemic. And so what you've offered us today is is really helpful for lots of folks and I mean validates a lot of what we're what we're discovering in teaching and learning and and advice we're sharing to people so it's really really great to hear that it's working out so well in your classroom well thank you thank mm-hmm. you for all the support mm-hmm. thank you well we have come to the end of another episode of my favorite lesson a podcast hosted by teaching and learning at Conestoga College you can find all episodes in this series and more by following Teaching and Learning at Conestoga on YouTube. You can also find this podcast on Spotify and other places you get your podcasts. If you subscribe, you'll be notified each time a new episode becomes available. For 24-7 support for all things teaching and learning related, please check out our Faculty Learning Hub at tlconestoga.ca. I'm Dr. Lauren Spring, reminding you, as the great Bell Hooks once said, that the classroom, with all its limitations, remains a location of possibility. Until next time.